Okay, I'm going to be reading some of uh, Martin Buber's Good and Evil to a song called Rise Up. Okay. The Tree of Knowledge. The biblical account of the so-called fall of man may well be founded upon a primeval myth of the envy and vengeance of gods, of whose contents we have no more than an inkling. The story that has been written down and preserved for us has acquired a very different meaning. The divine being whose actions are here recorded is repeatedly referred to with the exception of the dialogue between the serpent and the woman by an appellation alien to the style of the rest of the Bible, which is compounded out of a proper name interpreted elsewhere, Exodus 3, 14f, as he is there, and a generic term which is plural in form and corresponds most nearly to our Godhead. This God is the sole possessor of the power both of creation and of destiny. He is surrounded by other celestial beings, but all these are subject to him and without names or power of their own. Of course, he does not impose his will upon man. The last of his works, he does not compel him. He only commands, or rather forbids him, albeit under a severe threat. The man, and with him his woman, was not created till after the prohibition had been pronounced, but who appears to have been cognizant of it in some peculiar manner, while still a rib within the body of the man, may give or withhold his obedience, for he is at liberty, they are both at liberty, to accede to their creator or to refuse themselves to him. Yet their transgression of the prohibition is not reported to us as a decision between good and evil, but as something other, of whose otherness we must take account. The terms of the dialogue with the serpent are already strange enough. It speaks as though it knew very imprecisely what it obviously knows very precisely. Indeed, God has said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. It says and breaks off. Now the woman talks, but she too intensifies God's prohibition and adds to it words which he did not use. Touch it not, else you must die. As becomes manifest subsequently, the serpent is both right and wrong in denying that this will be the consequence. They do not have to die after eating. They merely plunge into human mortality, that is, into the knowledge of death to come. The serpent plays with the word of God, just as Eve played with it. And now the incident itself begins. The woman regards the tree. She does not merely see that it is a delight to the eye. She also sees in it that which cannot be seen, how good its fruit tastes, and that it bestows the gift of understanding. This seeing has been explained as a metaphorical expression for perceiving, but how could these qualities of the tree be perceived? It must be a contemplation that is meant, but it is a strange, dreamlike kind of contemplation. And so, sunk in contemplation, the woman plucks, eats, and hands to the man, and now he eats also, whose presence has... Don't come into the camera, please. And so, sunk in contemplation, the woman plucks, eats, and hands to the man, and now he eats also, whose presence has still then been revealed to us by neither word nor gesture. She seems moved by dream longing, but it seems to be truly in dream lassitude that he takes and eats. The whole incident is spun out of play and dream. It is irony, a mysterious irony of the narrator that spins it. It is apparent the two doers know not what they do more than this. They can only do it, they cannot know it. There is no room here for the pathos of the two principles as we see it in the ancient Iranian religion. Pathos of the choice made by the two themselves and by the whole of mankind after them. And nevertheless, both of them, good and evil, are to be found here, but in a strange, ironical shape which the commentators have not understood as such and hence have not understood at all. 
The tree of whose forbidden fruit the first humans eat is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So does God himself also call it. The serpent promises that by partaking of it, they would become like God, knowers of good and evil. And God seems to confirm this when he subsequently says that they have thereby become as one of us to know good and evil. <coughs> Oops, one second. That's not good. Wow, well, by comparison, I mean, it's a different mindset than what I want. Um... God seems to confirm this when he subsequently says that they have thereby become as one of us to know good and evil. This is the repetitive style of the Bible. The antithesis constantly reappears in fresh relationships with one another. Its purpose is to demonstrate with super clarity that it is they we are dealing with. But nowhere is their meaning inti intimated. The words may denote the ethical antithesis, but they may also denote that of beneficial and injurious or of delightful and repulsive. Immediately after the serpent speaks, the woman sees that the tree is good to eat, and immediately upon God's prohibition followed his dictum that it was not good that man should be alone. The adjective translated by evil is equally indefinite. In the main, throughout the ages, three interpretations have repeatedly emerged in, exp in explanation of what the first humans acquired by partaking of the fruit. One, which refers to the acquisition of sexual desire, is precluded both by the fact of the creation of man and woman as sexually mature beings and by the concept of becoming like God, which is coupled with the knowledge of good and evil. This God is suprasexual. The other interpretation relating to the acquisition of moral consciousness is no less contrary to the nature of this God. We have only to think of the declaration in his mouth that man... Now that he has acquired moral consciousness, must not be allowed to attain a Onian life as well. According to the third interpretation, the meaning of this knowledge of good and evil is nothing else than cognition in general, cognizance of the world, knowledge of all the good and bad things there are, for this would be in line with biblical usage, in which the antithesis good and evil is often used to denote anything, all kinds of things. But this interpretation, the favorite one today, is also unfounded. There is no place in the scriptures where the antithesis meant simply anything or all kinds of things. If all those passages which are taken as having the significance are examined in relation to the concrete nature, <laughs> the concrete nature of the current situation and the current intention of the speaker, they are always found to refer, in actual fact, to an affirmation or a negation of both good and bad, evil or ill, of both favorable and unfavorable. The be it, be it, which is always found in this context, does not relate to the whole scale of that which is inclusive of everything neutral, but precisely to the opposites, <laughs> to discrimination between them, even though no one... <laughs> you're losing me. 